Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne on a sunny Melbourne summer's morning saying thank you very much for finding my channel. I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne in Australia without any greenhouses or grow lights or humidifiers. They're either indoors or they're outdoors or they're out of the pool. So if that is of any interest to you, do hit subscribe. I post every week. I am a complete amateur. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. It is merely the result of my struggles amateurish as they are through growing orchids in my climate. And today, plant lovers, ta-da, look at all this green. We are going to do a very quick, perhaps not that quick, Miltasia checkup. The reason being, I was triggered in a positive way by this beauty. Now, the flowers are about to go over, I feel, but isn't it stunning? So the backstory is I have this Miltasia about which I made a film, which is linked here, and I'll also link it below. And it just did so extraordinarily well for me, and I will tell you the name of that and keep you out of suspense. It is Miltasia Lavender Kiss Lavender Taffy, and we've been through <laughs> my thoughts about the name Lavender Taffy. Anyway, the flowers are amazing and very long lasting. So this plant produced three fantastic spikes for me last season, which is it flowered for me in winter here in Australia. And as you can see, we'll get to it because <laughs> we can see it is a monstrous beast. But because I had so much success with it, I thought, hmm, Miltasias are clearly in my bandwidth. They grow very well here. I should try and find some more. Not that easy because here in Australia, I guess like many regions, you tend to only get a sort of a, a certain amount of variety within each orchid group. And obviously in Australia, we have quite strict biosecurity. So importing new material to kind of encourage local breeders to try and create different hybrids or even just bringing in other hybrids from say the States or Europe, is actually quite difficult. So often our choices are quite different from other people's. So the Great Miltasia Search produced not a lot. So the colors are quite particular. They're sort of um, a lavendery brown, beautiful, but most of the varieties I saw in Australia were all pretty similar or a version thereof in terms of the palette. And I thought, well, yes, you could have hundreds of things that were slightly different, but space is an issue. So why not try and find things that are quite different in terms of the flower color? So I found this beauty. Now this one, is called Miltasia Royal Robe and that whoops and that is my label so you might not be able to read it but Miltasia Royal Robe is a very uh, I would say maroony red so almost monochromatic so quite a strong single color which I thought would be a great contrast to this one I'll drop in an image of my blooms from this so you can see what I'm talking about have a google of this one though obviously it hasn't bloomed for me but I was very excited to find this. As you can see, plant lovers, it is a seedling, or should we say it was? Because quite clearly it is growing like the clappers. There are lots of new growths. And as you can see from this one, they're quite vigorous growths, but we'll get to that. So Miltasia Royal Robe was my next purchase and that took about a year to find and it just popped up on eBay. And I actually really haven't seen it much since. And then as you do every now and then, you type in your favorite orchid type and what should pop up but this. So this is a Miltasia, which is called Estralita Sweet Senorita. So there we are, Estralita Sweet Senorita. And as you can see from these flowers, it is a very, very pale green. Is it pale green or is it creamy green? Anyway, you can see that greeniness here and the lip is a lilac-y color, but again, quite pale going to white on the tip. So this flower is very different to Lavender Kiss Lavender Taffy, which is very different from Royal Robe. So I was really thrilled to find this. I bought it on eBay from, I think, uh, just a private grower, so not a commercial grower, and it was already in spike. So I'm not going to claim any of the glory for bringing this one into bloom. Curiously, though, it's midsummer and it's in bloom. Hmm. This one blooms for me in midwinter. And I think that's kind of what Miltasias do in my colder climate here in Australia. But anyway, perhaps this one came from warmer climes. Um, so I'm kind of curious about what this flowering cycle might be. But for me, the joy was finding a completely different Miltasia flower. All right. So I've now got three and I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to do a little catch up about Miltasias. 
So let's start at the very beginning, as I don't know, Julie Andrews may have said in The Sound of Music, with the history of Miltasias. And here's the thing, plant lovers, they are not called Miltasias. I am using the wrong name, and the officially recognised name is Bratonia. And I don't know about you, but I think I like the sound of Miltasia than Bratonia. Bratonia just sounds bratty and nasty and as though it'll be a vicious orchid that's narcissistic and all about itself. Whereas Miltasia sounds more open and voluptuous and gorgeous, <laughs> which I think suits the fact. Anyway, that's just me rambling. The origin of the two parts of the names, the brat and the onia, um, obviously come from the two species that were crossed to create it. And they are obviously Brassia and Miltonia. So both Brassias and Miltonias were discovered in the 18th century by European collectors in South America. And Brassia was named after William Brass, a very brassy name. And William Brass was a botanist who was under the auspice of Sir Joseph Banks, who was one of the great botanical explorers of Australia in the 18th century. And really the scientific founder of Kew Gardens in Britain, although it had existed before his time. So William Brass was a great mate of Joseph Banks, hence his name Brass was used to create the name of this wonderful new orchid that had been discovered, the Brassia. Now, as we know, Brassias are very spiky, they're very spidery. They can often have extraordinary long elements to the blooms. And it's that spideriness that has been used as crosses and other intergeneric hybrids over the time to give you spidery flowers. But then the other part of the cross will maybe change the lip or the color or the fragrance or the amount of flowering, etc. And brassias grow sort of in that band of Central America and Northern South America, quite a large range, but they do tend to be cooler and of a slightly higher elevation, and that is relevant. So that's one half of the paradigm. The other is Miltonia. And as we might know, Miltonias are also from South America, but basically from Brazil, from the North East bit of Brazil. And they tend to be a little more humid loving and a little more heat loving, so quite different environments to their Brassia cousins. And Miltonias were discovered at about the same time as Brassias in the sort of late 18th century by European plant hunters, and it was named after Viscount Milton, who was a Georgian chap and a collector of rare and unusual plants and an orchid enthusiast and quite a scientist. So he has been immortalized in the Miltonia part of the name, which obviously also includes Miltoniopsis now because, because they were separated off and used the same part of the name. Anyway, so there we go, potted cultural history, Brassia Miltonia. Now we come to their charming offspring, the Miltasias, which I will call them, even though we all now know they should be called Bratonia. So the thing about crossing like that, when you get two species and you cross them together, is figuring out which of the parent characteristics the cross might have. So for me, Miltasia, and this was my first experiment, Lavender Kiss, Lavender Taffy, which I think is a fairly easy hybrid to find all over the world. I've seen nurseries in Britain and the States that carry this, so I'm quite sure wherever you are in the world, if it is Miltasia land, you will find Lavender Kiss, Lavender Taffy. I think it's one of the most popular hybrids. So the thing then about these hybrids is trying to figure out what works for you. So as we know, I am in Melbourne, Australia. Now, we don't have the same climatic categories as you do in the United States because our climate is really about heat and rain rather than cold. So it's not about hardiness in our country. So it's kind of hard to compare with the American zoning system. But to give you an idea, we have cold, wet winters that don't freeze but can get pretty close to freezing. And we have hot, dry summers that can also be cool and wet. It's either described as warm temperate or cool Mediterranean, if that makes any sense to you. But I guess the key is our nighttime winter minimums in Melbourne city don't freeze. Which then leads us to the star, well, perhaps the, <laughs> the established star of the show, Miltasia Lavender Kiss, Lavender Taffy. So when I first bought this, I really knew nothing, ladies and gentlemen, about growing orchids. And in my desperation to try and figure out what I could grow and how, which is why I started this channel, because it's so hard to find the information, I kind of got the sense that Miltasias could take those low winter nighttime minimum temperatures, obviously as long as they are A, undercover, and B, not wet. Because as we know, cold and wet 
kills orchids. So I thought, well, you know what? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. This baby is gonna stay outside, and it has. And I would say I am now into my second year of owning this, and look at it. It is the happiest, most vigorous orchid yet seen. <laughs> well, perhaps not for you, but certainly for me. So in terms of where it is, then I'll give you an idea of its conditions. It is outside, and if you watched my growing space video, you will see exactly where it is, because I think I showed you. So it gets morning dappled light. It then gets general, quite bright dispersed light during the day. And in winter, it gets a little stronger direct sunlight in the morning, and in summer, a little less, but perhaps a little stronger general overhead lighting. So very similar conditions, basically, to oncidiums for me except I don't grow my insidiums outside all year. So it seems to thrive, and I think the most important thing about that is just to remember, firstly, it is undercover, so it never gets rained on, and secondly, I'm really careful about watering in winter, because what you don't want to do is water late in the day on a cold day, which is gonna be a cold night. So particularly if it's a clear day, which is sunny and wonderful, great time to water things in the morning, but that often means your nighttime minimum is gonna be quite low, so make sure you water sparingly in the morning. It has time to evaporate. And in winter, I really try and keep the leaves dry, because again, all sorts of airborne pathogens are much happier to lurk in cold, wet temperatures. So those are the two things to bear in mind. But by luck or who knows what else, divine intervention, it's thrived and here it is. This is an interesting case in the three stages of life, birth, death, and the bit in the middle. <laughs> Not that we're gonna talk about death. So this one, I think, let me take the tag out of the way. Firstly, you can see how vigorous it is. So it's sending out new growths exponentially. There is kind of no directional point really, although you can probably see that this was probably the pseudo bulb that was the original division. And in fact, it has grown to left and right, but it's also growing out to the back. So it's kind of growing in three directions. As you can see, it is mad. And I am going to have to repot this in spring. So once it's done with its winter flowering, I am going to repot it. And I will make a video about it actually, because it's a beast and it's going to take some management. But the interesting thing you can see here, I think, is its growth pattern. So Miltonias, which is half of its ancestral parentage, are very creeping, very obviously rhizomous orchids. So you can kind of see the rhizome above the soil level and it creeps, produces a new plant, creeps, etc. And as you can see, this one is certainly making a break for it. I would say that growth habit in the Miltasia slash Bratonia is slightly different to the Miltonia the original species because the Miltonias are very, the rhizome is very above ground and you can certainly see that it wants to run along the surface. So that's interesting. Miltasias have that same vigor, which means when you're planting it, potting it, thinking about all that, you're gonna have to bear in mind that it's gonna expand rapidly. So you don't need deeper pots, you just need wider pots. And I've actually been looking at bonsai pots because they're quite shallow, but quite broad. I think quite good for orchids that have this running tendency because I don't want to chop it up. I want to have a big specimen because you get more flower spikes, obviously. So that is that one. That is Miltasia lavender taffy, which has got lots of new growths. So we'll see how many spikes I get this winter. And we'll certainly perhaps do a follow up about it because it is amazing. Um, otherwise, so we've covered its light requirements, we've covered its temperature range, so it can certainly deal with those colder winter minimums, and it can certainly deal with the heat of summer here. I think that's because of its Brazilian blood from the Miltonias. I don't make a huge effort with humidity on this one. I do mist in summer and I spray in summer to keep the whole area quite humid. Other than that, I kind of just leave it to do its thing. I obviously try and water it more because it's such a vigorous plant in summer, and I certainly fertilize it more than the others because of its size again. So I fertilize in spring, and I might do a sort of a top up in autumn, but a gentle one as we go into its flowering production season. And for me, that is slow release general fertilizer in grains, which I sprinkle along the top of the medium. I also give all of these orchids a liquid fertilizer or a liquid tonic about once every third watering during the growing season. So really from spring till the end of autumn. And that can be either an orchid specific liquid fertilizer or a fish emulsion or a seaweed emulsion, whatever it might be. 
dial down the dilution though, I always go to about one eighth of what they recommend. And then medium wise, it is in for me a pretty generic mix. Both the ancestors are epiphytic, so it's just a loose mix. So you can use whatever you use for Miltonias, Miltoniopsis, Oncidiums, Brassias, which is medium sized bark with a little bit of perhaps sphagnum moss chopped up with a little bit of charcoal, with a little bit of perlite and a little bit of shell grit, which is full of calcium, and of course, mycorrhizal fungi and slow release fertilizer. All right, so we've got this established plant and I bought it not realizing it was a quite vigorous division and it bloomed for me quite quickly and it's growing extraordinarily. So this is a seedling. I probably bought this seedling about a year ago and it has produced two new growths and some of the leaves are a bit tatty, I have to say, because this is living outside with its older sibling because I want to make sure that it's just gonna be used to that weather conditions for me. And one of the side effects of that is baby caterpillars. Bear that in mind if you're growing your orchids outside. And caterpillars love the new growth on small, baby orchids so you can see that some of the leaves have really been stripped and um, sometimes those caterpillars are so small that you really can't see them until you start to see this kind of nudity in the leaves you think what is going on and you find the culprits and you often see their droppings little black balls first which gives you an idea that you've got a bit of a caterpillar problem anyway I just generally pick them off if I can but you can also just use an oil-based spray which is going to suggest the caterpillars move on so quite a vigorous grower it was just a small plant when I bought it with maybe just I think one pseudo bulb uh, and it has grown pretty quickly and if this is any indication it's going to go like the clappers so I would say that this is probably a year old maybe next year I would get flowers. So perhaps in the second mature year, you might get flowers, I'm not sure. Perhaps you can tell me if you've grown Miltasias from seedlings, how quickly they come to fruition. So that is one way to buy them as a seedling. This is the other as an established plant. And then we kind of have this in the middle. Now, this one is the one that I bought because I could see the flowers were very different to the other two. And you can see, I think quite clearly that this plant has been grown from a division. So we probably had a couple of pseudo bulbs from a division of a plant, perhaps this size, and then we've had a new growth, and then we've had a new growth, and it is this new growth that is flowered for me. And like other orchids in this group, it is the new growth that is gonna give you the flower spike. So like many orchids, it's all about promoting vegetative growth. And you don't really have to focus on that if you're giving the orchid what it wants in terms of its water, its light, and fertilizer and its ambient temperature and environment, obviously. So if all those things are right, the orchid is just gonna keep growing with its new growth and hopefully producing flower spikes for you. So this one, as you can see already, it's got that kind of creeping habit that Miltonia ancestry gives it. And what I would imagine happening after this flower spike goes over is that we'll start to see a new growth forming at the bottom here, and then that will continue going on. Now, as we perhaps know, I love a terracotta pot and I don't love plastic. However, this one arrived as it is with a spike, so I am not about to repot something that's in spike. And also, it is midsummer. Needless to say, though, that heat is not a great time to be repotting orchids unless you absolutely have to for some strange reason. So I will wait to repot this one until that flower spike has gone over and in spring when I can just start to see some new growths emerging. And I will use the same kind of mix and I will use a terracotta pot because for me it is about aesthetics. I just think they look nicer. It's also not plastic and terracotta has some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are it evaporates water really quickly so your free draining mix will drain even quicker and not keep your orchid roots damp and squishy which can be very negative particularly in cold weather. And that evaporation also creates a little bit sort of, of humidity around the plant. The negative though is the same thing but from the obverse angle is that in summer it dries out really quickly. So your watering regime needs to be attuned to seasonal change. So here in Australia, this terracotta will dry out really, really quickly in the dry heat of summer. So I do have to keep my eye on watering. So the positives of plastic are it is lighter, it's cheaper, it's often transparent, so you can see what root activity is going on. And a lot of orchids 
Well, some orchids can actually photosynthesize through the roots and a lot of them are epiphytic. So the roots aren't in a medium, they're kind of on a surface. So there is a lot of light and air around the roots of orchids. So, you know, I get all of that. But so saying this pot just still has a few drainage points at the bottom. It has no aeration around the side. And you know what, my orchids are all happy and I think whatever suits you in your climate is the way to go. And climate does have a great deal to do with how you can grow your orchids, how you should pot them, what you should pot them in. So there's no given actually, I told you the mix that I use here, but if you're in a much more humid environment, you could do much more sphagnum moss based. If you're in somewhere where you have to create much more of an artificial environment because of your external climate, you might be growing them in self-watering systems. So it all depends on how you're growing and where you're growing, but these are my preferences. So there we are, plant lovers. I think for me, I have discovered that the Miltasia slash Bratonia, but I don't like that name, that hybrid works really well in this climate. It can take the cold winter minimums as long as it doesn't get below freezing often and as long as there's no frost and as long as you keep them dry in those temperatures and that they're covered over. So it's a really tough, really useful orchid. They are incredibly vigorous growers. They're very floriferous when they're ready and the flowers are really beautiful. They all tend to be a version of this spikiness from its brassia cousins and the beautiful lips of the Miltonias. No fragrance. Oh, I'm lying to you. Actually, it's a very slight Vanilla fragrance to this, very slight though. You know, with other orchids, you can smell the fragrance generally in the air, not with that, but um, quite a beautiful fragrance. The flowers are also long lasting and I bring the flowering plants into the house when they're in bloom so we can enjoy it. And they're really tough. They don't seem to mind that either. So as an orchid, you could certainly grow indoors all the time, or if you're in a climate like mine, they do very well outside. There we are, plant lovers, Miltasia Catchup 101. I now have three plants at different stages of their cycle. It'll be great to see how Lavender Taffy goes again for its second flowering season with me. Great to see when Royal Robe flowers and great to see that Estralita Sweet Senora does well with its repotting, with its regrowth and next season comes into bloom. And I'll be curious to see what the flowering cycle of this will be once it settles into my climate. Anyway, watch this space, as they say in the classics. I look forward to seeing you next week with another continuing adventure of my amateur orchid growing. And until then, plant lovers, see you next week.